In this video, we are going to drive all the way from Miami, Florida to Chicago, Illinois and back. We're gonna hang out with our relatives near Atlanta, Georgia. We'll pass by Rock City near Chattanooga, Tennessee, enjoy the nightlife in Nashville, explore Mammoth Cave National Park, the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. We'll hang out with more family in Louisville, Kentucky, drive through Indiana and its capital, Indianapolis, visit the RV Hall of Fame in Elkhart, the Indiana Dunes Lakeshore, the great city of Chicago, then St. Louis, Missouri, Memphis, Tennessee, and finally, finally we'll enjoy the amazing white sand beaches of Destin, Florida. So strap in and buckle up, because the great American road trip of 2016 is next. I'm free in my RV yeah. Hello everybody! Today we are beginning a great adventure The Great American Road Trip of 2016 We stop here at the gas station briefly to check the tire pressure which is always a good precaution but more so on this trip because we intend to drive from Miami all the way to Chicago, Illinois and back, way over 3,000 miles. This is our 23rd trip with Mini Tini the trailer and it is going to be a great adventure, I can feel it. If you've seen my previous videos, you know we usually encounter horrible heavy traffic leaving Miami, especially on a holiday weekend like this one, so I've decided to avoid the interstate and take US 27 North. But let's face it, Miami rush hour traffic is unavoidable. And we get stuck here on Legend Road by the airport. A good half hour later, <laughs> we take the overpass onto Okeechobee Road, which is, by the way, the beginning of US 27, as we go through our neighboring city of Hialeah. Oh, Hialeah, la ciudad que progresa. As we slowly exit the city, the traffic gets lighter and lighter and eventually we're gonna have the road almost to ourselves. Hello everybody! And I thought uh, exiting Miami through US 27 was going to be a good idea. Obviously that didn't turn out so well, but uh, live to learn. I think the trick is not to leave Miami at rush hour. I think that would be the trick. Anyways, we are embarking on this uh, great adventure. We're going north on US 27, and that's gonna be most of the day, most of this, uh, our first official day on the road. I am officially calling this first segment of the trip the long and not so winding road, because boy, is it long and flat. As we approach the town of South Bay, I think we are ready for our first break of the trip. All right, everybody, we're taking a quick break here at John Stretch uh, Memorial Park. Right next to the shopping park. And then we continue north. The sunset is coming up. By the way, that levee you see on the other side, that's Lake Okeechobee. We continue riding into the sunset. As the sun begins to set, we approach the small town of Clouston and what a beautiful sunset it is. We continue driving well into the night, but as fatigue sets in, we decide to stop and go to sleep near Orlando. Well, we're staying here at the Walmart 
in Claremont, Florida, which is very near Orlando. We've driven about 130 plus miles and um, I'm tired. I think I deserve an adult beverage. Hasta mañana. Yep, good night. And good morning from the Walmart at Claremont, Florida, just west of Orlando. Going into Walmart to get some antifreeze. Kia was running a little hot last night. It is time to hit the road again. There's still a long, long way ahead of us. We continue north on US 27. Hey everybody, well that was a very nice Walmart. We stayed uh, back there at Claremont, Florida. I recommend it. It is all very nice, almost picturesque, but at this rate we are never going to make it, so eventually we give up on US 27 and take the dreaded Florida Storm Pike, which by the way it is a toll road. Yep, there's a Sampas. Cha-ching! <laughs> A few miles further down the road, we merge onto I-75, and the problem with the turnpike and the interstate is that everything looks more or less the same, so it's boring. Let's take a break at this rest area. We are somewhere in between uh, Ocala and Gainesville, and we are about two hours behind uh, our original schedule, but it doesn't matter. We'll make it there eventually. The big train has it next to me. Oh, it's a semi-truck. <laughs> you see, it is endless. I think Georgia is on our minds. Georgia! Yes, Georgia is on our minds. And boy, Florida is a long state. We continue. Gas in Georgia is a few cents cheaper than in Florida, so we usually wait until we cross the border and top off the tank. We get off the interstate here in Valdosta and we go to the Walmart Supercenter. And while you all enjoy this pretty time-lapse, I'm going to take a shower. Inside the RV, of course. We also cook a quick snack, some Spanish chorizo with beer. Mmm, yummy! As you can see, it is a very long, unrewarding drive that, to be honest, I'm not gonna bore you with anymore. And here we are, Macon also called the heart of Georgia, uh, for being near the geographical center of the state. In the 1800s, the city thrived as the hub of the cotton industry. Like many cities in the south, Macon has suffered some economic problems in recent years. We are approaching the downtown area. To the left you can barely see it, but there's the Holy Cross Greek Orthodox Church and the round building that's part of the medical center of central Georgia. We make a left here on Poplar Street and here we see two beautiful churches. The St. Joseph Catholic Church to the left and the First Baptist Church up ahead. Okay. This is one of those places that I am putting on my revisit list. I would love to explore the streets of Macon a little more when we have more time. As we turn here, by the US Post Office building, we stumble upon College Street. And unfortunately, the camera doesn't really capture it well, but the street is lined up on both sides with antebellum mansions and other beautiful buildings. What a pleasant surprise this serendipitous discovery is. Macon, we shall return. We continue north towards Atlanta. 
but we are going to stay off the interstate this time for real. I am seriously tired of I-75. <laughs> we continue due north on US-23, and it is such a pretty countryside. We are near the community of Juliet and the Piedmont National Wildlife Refuge. It is all very pretty, but after so many hours, even driving through the forest can become tiresome. Well, it looks like we are going to make it right on time for dinner. You see, my plan worked after all, even after being two hours behind schedule this morning and all that. By the way, I always make these meticulously detailed plans before we go on a trip. I mean, always with the intention of changing them, of course, and allow serendipity to play a role as well. And besides, it is so much fun to plan and they're always a good reference to have afterwards. All right, we made it. We enjoy some quality time with the family and off we go again. Good morning. Uh, well, last night we slept here at uh, Walmart in Marietta, Georgia. And uh, today well, we're going to uh, uh, go northwest and uh, we're going to visit the Rock Gardens where they have a place where supposedly you can see seven states. And uh, from there, we're gonna just pass by Chattanooga and then Nashville. So let's hit the road. Yep, we're continuing north on I 75. See a rest area coming up. Let's have breakfast. We're making scrambled eggs with a ham and spinach. Two types of ham. We got off the interstate here by Calhoun, which is actually where I originally intended to spend the night. So we are once again two hours behind schedule. How the heck did that happen? Here's the historic downtown, so let's stop for a second and take a quick video. We are here in historic Calhoun. Here we are, in front of the Calhoun City Hall. Okay, I know it is pronounced Calhoun, but I didn't know at the time. Let's continue. Pretty picturesque town. I hope we have time to explore it more sometime in the future. We take the more picturesque uh, secondary roads on our way to Chattanooga and now comes the more challenging part of this trip for me because I have never really driven on hilly terrain with Minitini in tow and I am particularly concerned downhill because I am not entirely confident about my tow vehicle's stopping power. And uphill? Well, we might overheat but we can always slow down or stop altogether. Well, so far, so good. 
we have made it through two large states, Florida and Georgia. And I think everything from now on is going to feel relatively close in comparison. And we're definitely going to stop more often. We really have to slow down. Hey, I believe that's uh, Rock City on top of that ridge. Uh, here we are by the border of Georgia and Tennessee. And if you don't look closely, you might miss the state line. Okay, you probably missed it. Let me rewind and give you an instant replay. Yep, that's it. Where is my big sign so I can post it on Instagram? Nah, I guess they don't really bother on these secondary roads. Anyways, this is all part of Chattanooga, Tennessee. It is the St. Elmo Historic District, to be exact. Apparently, there are many buildings from the 19th and early 20th century, and hundreds of them are actually in the National Registry of Historic Places. The Google lady wants me to make a left here on 45th Street, and then a right on the, the Guild Trail, and I really have no business going through these narrow streets with the trailer in tow. And the grades are pretty steep too, let me tell you. Maybe I'll need to get me one of those RV-specific GPS devices in the future. We make another left here onto Tennessee 58. And if I thought we were going through some bad steep grades on the rolling hills after Calhoun, I'll think again. This is really hardcore and it goes on forever. I hear the engine grinding and the temperature gauge slowly creeping up to the danger zone. Overheating is actually one of the worst things you can do to an engine, so I'm going to have to stop soon. Actually, let me stop right here and let the people behind pass. It is going to be a slow climb. And talk about a white knuckle drive. And back in Georgia we are. Yes, that's the Georgia on our minds sign. Sight of Lover's Leap is a sign that we are almost there. Here we are, arriving at Rock City. It is the long weekend before Memorial Day and this place is bustling with tourists. When I decided to come here, I truly didn't know this place would be so popular or Disneyfied, for that matter. I imagined it would be just like a park, you know, with a lookout point, uh, like a balcony where you could supposedly see the seven states. By the way, the oversized vehicle parking is full, as expected. But luckily, they are pretty well organized, actually, and they find a spot for us right at the end. We do have to make a pretty long line to get our tickets, uh, about half an hour, and general admission is 20 bucks. Rock City became a tourist attraction back in the early 1930s, at the site of a community called Fairyland, founded by one Garnet Carter and his wife Frida. These rock formations happened to be inside the Fairyland community, and it was Frida's idea to develop this part of the property into a great rock garden with all kinds of plants, trails around the rocks, and statues of gnomes and other fairy tale characters imported from Germany. This first part is called the Grand Corridor. And yeah, the park is really crowded on this particular date. Understandably. Eventually, we managed to go into this other area called the Needle's Eye, and I guess the name derives from it being this narrow path between rock formations that you have to walk through, like the eye of the needle. Yep, it is pretty narrow through here, but not too bad. We fit fine. Narrow, narrow. <laughs> 
There are plenty of signs saying to stay on the trail. We are approaching the Gnome Valley, and as the name suggests, there are little gnome statues all over the place. I don't know if any of them are the same German statues Frida placed back in the 1920s. More research should go into that. It is still pretty cool. Coming up next is the Mushroom Rock. We see some people having a picnic here. Very cool. Swell time. Next, we go on the Gnomes Overpass, which goes over the Grand Corridor, where we were just a few minutes ago. Okay. I guess not everybody read the sign about staying on the trail. Anyways, next we go to the Goblins Underpass, which is just this tunnel. These attractions are mainly geared towards children, as you can see, and even though I am perhaps 40 years too old for this, I am having a pretty good time. Coming up next is the Swing Along Bridge, and it seems to be a lot of fun. Some people, however, are perhaps overdoing it a little bit, having a little too much fun with the Swing Along Bridge. Right next to it, there's a stone bridge, well, just in case you are afraid of heights. The views are fantastic though. We continue walking along uh, the swing along bridge, uh, not swinging so much this time and enjoying the sights, which are about to get a lot better at Lover's Leap, I hear. We are approaching Lover's Leap, the famous viewpoint, and I believe that's the road that we were driving on earlier. I could be wrong. And to the north, we can see downtown Chattanooga. Down there we see a Rock City sign, which is actually one of many used back in the day to advertise the park. And here's the waterfall, which I was sorry to find out is artificial, actually, but it's still very pretty. And another one of those pesky gnomes. And here's the famous seven state sign. Actually, you can't really see seven states, I found out. You can see Tennessee for sure. Kentucky and Virginia, however, are a little bit of a stretch. You could see them maybe if the earth was flat, but they are too far, hence below the horizon. North Carolina is somewhere out there, but South Carolina is also probably too far as well. Then, obviously, Georgia and Alabama. So, despite the seven flags and the sign, in reality you can only see four states. Yeah, Kentucky, Virginia and South Carolina are beyond the horizon, but regardless of how many states you can actually see, it is still a great commanding view. The musician is no other than Matt Downer, old-time traveler. An Alabama native and Chattanooga resident, he plays the fiddle, the banjo, the guitar and has dedicated his career to the preservation of traditional music. He has studied the repertoire and techniques of many of the elder Tennessee, Alabama and Georgia musicians, so he is the real deal. What a treat it is to listen to his music. They have this area here with food and drinks, and they even have their own Seven States beer. Fatman Squeeze. We continue touring the park, and the next portion is called Fat Man Squeeze. Not very politically correct in today's world, but I can see how a voluminous person could have a hard time going through. <laughs> Thank you. 
Then there's the deer park, where we could see only one deer. It's a deer, we continue enjoying great views of the valley as we walk through. Only one deer in Deer Park? <laughs> and here we see another great view of the Lover's Leap and the artificial cascade and the Rainbow Hall. <laughs> Well, it is actually quite picturesque, and the view, well, the view is unbeatable. And now we approach the Fairyland Caverns. The cave is lined up with gnomes and fairy tale creatures, enhanced by clever lighting, some of them painted in fluorescent colors, you know, enhanced by black lights. It's quite a cool effect. And then there's uh, this large room with a castle in the middle, and all these uh, figurines, uh, you know, depicting scenes from fairy tales, uh, painted the same way, you know, so they are enhanced by an array of black lights on the ceiling. Here. It is time to continue. We did go through Chattanooga and then I-24 which goes briefly back into Georgia and then on to Tennessee and you're going to say what the heck happened to Chattanooga? Well we had a camera malfunction but in this case you didn't miss much, we just drove through downtown. Here we are crossing the Tennessee River so let's stop at the Welcome Center. Marion County Park. We relax here for a little while by this bend of the Tennessee River. It is all very nice and peaceful. We wish we could stay at the nearby campground, but another time perhaps. Look who's up there. Okay, let's get back on the road. We are going to Nashville, the music city.
Okay, it may not look like much here on the video, but we've been going up a pretty steep grade for a couple of miles and Kia is starting to feel it. She is overheating a little bit. So I'm just going to pull over here and let it cool down. We continue slowly climbing up at about 40 miles per hour. As you can see, everybody else is zooming past us. It looks like this guy in front of us is having a little trouble as well. Even more so than us, it appears. He's going 30. So I'm going to try to pass him. It's a long drive, like with three hours, even longer towing the trailer and having to slow down in the mountains. But eventually, we make it to the outskirts of Nashville. And our campground. Yes, a campground. What a concept. After two days Walmart camping, we need to empty our holding tanks, uh, plug into shore power, you know, creature comforts. It is the Memorial Day weekend, as I said, and all the other campgrounds had a three-day minimum. But here at the KOA, the minimum was two days. So that's why we're staying here. We paid a total of $67 per night after all was said and done. A little expensive, perhaps, but hey, we're here. Nashville, Tennessee, we have arrived and uh, we really have to slow down. It's been a long drive from Rock City and um, I had some technical difficulty with the GoPro on top of the trailer. Actually more like user error and uh, mixed with technical difficulties and we don't have a video. But then I managed to fix it. Anyways, let's enjoy Nashville, Tennessee. We're going to take an Uber to downtown. I don't really feel like driving. Besides, we might have a few adult beverages. Here we are by the corner of 2nd Avenue and Broadway. And uh, this street, uh, Broadway, is where all the honky-tonk bars are, where the action is, you know, the touristy area, if you will. It begins here uh, by the Cumberland River and it goes uh, west uh, for a few blocks. Tomorrow during the day perhaps we'll explore the riverfront a little more, but right now we are kind of hungry, so we're gonna grab a beer and get something to eat. It is the Sunday before Memorial Day and everything is super crowded. You're just gonna walk around for a little bit, you know, get a feel for the area. Every single bar has live music and I love that. And check out the Honky Tonk Central on the other side of the street. That place is packed. By the way, Nashville is also a popular destination for bachelorette parties. And uh, the Pedal Tavern, that contraption, seems to be a very popular group activity, as you can see. Man, this place is crazy busy. That's the AT&T building, which is colloquially known as the Batman building, and you can see the resemblance. And there it is again. 
we're actually walking towards this street called uh, the printer's alley which is supposed to have all these bars but to be honest this is a little bit of a disappointment i guess i had uh, high expectations but well, this is it originally it was the site of two large newspapers hence the name but it probably became famous during the early 20th century because the establishments sold liquor illegally what a concept. Well, liquor sales in restaurants here in Nashville were actually not legal until 1968. Can you believe that? We finally decided to go into a bar. And they have this uh, Red Hook Long Hammer IPA on special, which is uh, quite nice, actually. We are actually more hungry than thirsty at this point, uh, but none of these bars uh, serve food. I just found out. <laughs> I do enjoy the music quite a bit, actually. Nothing like a live band playing the blues. And I also get a kick out of all the people dancing. Very cool. Alright, let me get a second beer since we're not driving anyways. I do apologize in advance for some of the low quality of the video. I didn't really know how crazy it was going to get, so all I brought for camera was my phone. Actually, it's not so bad for being the phone. The two beers on an empty stomach are hitting us pretty hard as expected. So we go to the only place we found that served food at this time, Margaritaville, of all places. And while the food and drinks are obviously not a Nashville thing, the band is legit. At some point they begrudgingly perhaps play the Jimmy Buffett classic that gives this establishment its name. Uh, we're tired and a little drunk, so time to go home. And we're going to Natural KOA. It is morning in Nashville. Let's explore. There's the Bridgestone Arena and the Music Center to the right, the Country Music Hall of Fame to the left, which we'll visit later. Walking along the Walk of Fame Park, we cross the street and here's this fountain representing the birth of Apollo, right next to the Shermerhorn Symphony Center, home of the Nashville Symphony. The building was completed in 2006, its neoclassical design, inspired by some of the world's great concert halls. We walk on the pedestrian bridge uh, to see this view of downtown and the Nissan Stadium on the other side of the Cumberland River, which is home of the Tennessee Titans. walk towards Broadway. And Broadway looks very different from last night. It is slowly waking up. Actually, all the tourists are still asleep. We see this guy pressure cleaning the street from last night, a wild party perhaps. Uh, I'm sure from last night. We walk by Printer's Alley once again on our way to Capitol Hill. This right here is the downtown Presbyterian Church, which has been designated a National Historic Landmark. And this right here is a statue of the legendary Chet Atkins, with an empty stool next to him. Man, I wish I would have brought my guitar. As we approach Capitol Hill, here we see the War Memorial. This building in front of us is the Tennessee State Capitol. As we see it here from the Legislative Plaza, which is really the side of the building, not the front. The Greek Doric building is the War Memorial. And today being Memorial Day, it seems very appropriate for us to be here and honor those who made the ultimate sacrifice. 
The statue in the middle of the courtyard symbolizes victory. And there are also two smaller memorials on the south end of the plaza. This one, as you can tell by the map, is dedicated to the Korean War. And this right here, that's uh, the Vietnam War Memorial. Alright, let's continue. You know what? I really, really like Nashville so far. Let's walk towards Broadway uh, once again. And it looks like they are going to have a Memorial Day concert. We haven't had breakfast yet, so we want to find something to eat. Here's this famous honky-tonk called Tootsies, which is right next to the historic Ryman Auditorium. The Ryman Auditorium is a historic landmark which dates back to 1892 and is often called the Mother Church of Country Music. Okay, let's go here into the Legends Corner and let's do something radical, like having a beer before noon, heck, before breakfast. And it turns out this is actually the highlight of the trip so far. Here we are, in the music city, listening to some beautiful country music, drinking before noon at this fantastic place, just the way I like it, not too crowded. The walls are covered with records, and the lady, she also plays the violin, but I only captured it in this live video I posted on Facebook, hence the lower quality, I apologize. Follow me on Facebook for more live videos like this one. Next, we go into the Country Music Hall of Fame, and the musician playing is no other than the guitar virtuoso David Anderson, and he has been a permanent fixture here for the better part of the decade. It is here that we finally get something to eat, of all places. And then, well, we tour the museum. The first section is dedicated to the Bachmann Gretsch guitar exhibit with over 70 guitars, illustrating the evolution of the instrument. And I'm sorry about the slideshow here, but they wouldn't allow video recording inside the museum, and I decided to follow the rules this time. This 1962 Pontiac Bonneville belonged to the famous honky-tonker Webb Pierce, and here's Elvis Presley's solid gold Cadillac, with 24 karat gold-plated trimmings, a gold-plated TV, record player, ice maker, and even a phone. And here's Elvis's gold piano. Here's a recreation of Owen Bradley's office. And uh, you know, this is what would have been my dream recording studio back in the early 90s. This circle is the actual Hall of Fame, and if you stand in the center, the acoustics are so good that you can hear your own voice reflected back. Yes, I can hear myself back. Wow. Next, we take a bus tour to the famous RCA Studio B. By the way, this tour is only offered at several times uh, during the day, so do make a reservation. Our guide is a virtual encyclopedia. His narration full of anecdotes. And that uh, created that reverb or that echo effect. If you will please try to make your way in as quickly as you can, just follow me right in the front door. We'll resume the tour once everybody's inside. Here's our guide uh, next to this poster with all of Elvis's hits recorded here. 
You know, I am a sucker for vintage audio equipment, so I am in heaven here, ogling all these old recorders and mixers. It is so cool. That's the turntable Elvis used to listen to demos, until one day he got pissed and kicked it. We step into the actual recording room. The different color lights uh, were there to set the mood, uh, depending on the song. Actually, Elvis's hit, Are You Lonesome Tonight?, was recorded in complete darkness. And here I get a chance to sit at Elvis's favorite grand piano. And we are right in the heart of Music Rail. Music, this is a publishing company, Carnival Music. The gentleman who owns it, Frank Liddell, works out of there every day. Very famous producer. Toby Keys recorded there. Shania Twain from Canada. Kenny Chesney, the group Alabama, recorded almost everything they did there. This is built as the Capitol Records building. It's now Word Entertainment. Studio A, still very much active, right next door to Studio B. Reba McIntyre Starstruck Studios is on your left. And of course, Reba McIntyre records here today. I heard so much in Mike Kerb owning Studio B. He founded Kerb Records. We're now turning on to 16th Avenue, Music Square East. As we make the turn, if you look out to the right, you're gonna see a red brick building coming up. And inside the red brick building is where the Kwanzaa Hut recording studio was located. That's where Patsy Cline recorded. That's where Bob Dylan recorded his albums. And that is the building where Chris Christopherson was a janitor when he first worked on Music Row. Warner Brother Records is coming up on your right, and actually also on your left. And then also on your left, right after that, is going to be Spence Manor Suites, where Elvis Presley stayed. Okay, we're back at the Hall of Fame, and uh, let's take another Uber. Let's uh, explore the city a little more. And there's another one of those uh, party bike contraptions. <laughs> Pretty cool. And that right there is a famous Nashville hot chicken place. And take a look at the line. Here we are at Centennial Park, where they have this uh, replica of the Parthenon. It was built in 1897 for the Centennial Exposition. Inside, uh, there is a 42-foot statue of the goddess Athena, like in the original Parthenon, but we don't really feel like paying to go inside. Besides, our time here in Nashville, unfortunately, is coming to an end. It is the music city, all right. Music everywhere, even here. It is such a beautiful day, and it is such a shame we have to leave so soon. Back at the KOA, most people have left, and soon, so will we. Anyway, we have left so many things unseen in this great city that we must come back sometime soon. Okay, next time we come, we have to spend more time, definitely. This is really just an overview, and to be honest, I never intended my stay here to be anything more than that, an overview. Next time, uh, I'll have to try that hot chicken, go into the Ryman Auditorium and the Symphony Center for sure, and just walk around the city more. Explore the local life and not just uh, the touristy Broadway. Stumble upon the controversial Musica sculpture. Controversial, you know why? Because it depicts naked people, really. You know what? I really, really liked Nashville. Even though we paid for two nights here at the KOA, it was the minimum on this uh, long weekend, it was always my intention to stay only one night. But with the extra night, uh, we had the option to leave later than the regular checkout time, which is very convenient. Greetings from Kentucky. Kentucky is such a pretty state, especially the countryside. It looks nice even from the highway, and right now, as you can see, it is pretty flat. 
But as we go further north and further to the east, we will see more and more rolling hills. This is our second time here in Kentucky, but when we came back in 2011, we just drove through. And this time we're also driving through, don't get your hopes up. But we're just going to do it a little slower. We are on the way to Mammoth Cave National Park. Mammoth Cave is supposed to be the largest cave system in the world, that we know of, with over 400 miles and counting, and I say counting because they still haven't been able to explore the whole thing. Let's uh, make sure that the GoPro is actually recording, and it obviously is. And here we are, Mammoth Cave National Park. Let's look for the campground and let's hope we can get there before it gets dark. The speed limit in the park is 35 miles per hour, so driver beware. and it looks like we have arrived. There's no one on duty at the entrance to greet us at this time, so we just uh, drive through to our reserved site, which is, by the way, Lucky 13 on Loop B. Our primitive no-hookup site here will set us back $20, and beware, there is no cellular coverage whatsoever, just a very slow Wi-Fi near the general store. We have arrived here at the Mammoth Cave uh, National Park and we are here at the Mammoth Cave campground and hopefully tomorrow we can see the, the caves. This is a weird uh, setup because this was a one-way street and as I drove in the service side of the vehicle is what's facing uh, my table. It is very nice, very peaceful. Listen to all the birds singing. We walk around the campground a little bit, and we are really contemplating the idea of moving into a camper van at some point in the future. And there's Minitini. What a nice shot. We are famished, and the store, quite conveniently, is still open at this time. So let's get some pasta and tomato sauce for dinner. We actually have some spinach in the fridge that is about to go bad, so... Hmm. Every cooking show, we're making pasta. Got some uh, prego tomato sauce from the store, and we're gonna make some and some pasta. We're gonna have some pasta because we're hungry. We're here at Mammoth Cave Campground. Bon appetit! And you know what I love about these remote places? You can actually see the stars. Good morning from the Mammoth Cave Campground here in Kentucky. It is a beautiful day. Even though the visitor's center is within walking distance, just about a half a mile away, we are going to drive there because we are leaving right after the tour. We book the two hour long Domes and Dripstones tour. This bus is going to take us to the new entrance to the cave, and here to the right we see the campground and the store. The ride to the entrance of the cave takes about 10 minutes. 
If I can have one gripe, uh, one complaint about the tour, is that the group is way too large. We can barely hear the guide if we fall just a little behind. As I said before, we are going in through the new entrance, which was blasted into this sinkhole we are going to be descending through by one John Morrison, who wanted to commercialize a different entrance to the cave back in 1916. And look who's here to greet us. You see, too many people. The whole cave experience is one long bottleneck. At some points, like here, it is a pretty narrow squeeze between the walls. And down and down we go. We are actually descending into a couple of hundred feet underground. And as you can see, there's a lot of wildlife down here. Yikes. Oh boy. Man, it looks like we're going towards the center of the earth. Eventually, it flattens out as we reach a drier part of the cave. This large room is called the Grand Central Station because many small corridors connect here. And besides taking a break, we get a lengthy explanation about the discovery of the cave, its history, and how it originally opened to the public. Hey George, a very happy man. He has most of that world famous historic mammoth cave. It looks like this passage we're currently sitting in. And many of the other show caves in the area look like the section of cave that we'll see at the very end. So not a lot of caves have that. <coughs> and today we're going to go through three different types of cave passages. Here's some historic graffiti, probably from the earlier explorers who came here in the early 1800s. We continue towards the next section of the cave, and there is a guide in front of us and one in the back, making sure no one is left behind. The one in the back is also responsible for turning off the lights. In this section of the cave, all these rocks have fallen onto one another until they have reached a state of stability. This part of the cave is also very dry. Nothing like the sinkhole we came through earlier, in which water was dripping all over the place. This is what they call, I guess, a dead cave, which is no longer being eroded. Take a look at the flat ceiling up ahead. It almost looks artificial. It is that layer of denser rock that keeps this part of the cave dry. In this room we get another very informative session to which we are late, of course. The green pigment on some of the walls and ceilings is actually algae, brought here by us, inadvertently, visitors and tourists that come to the cave. In this area coming up, we start seeing more evidence of water erosion. 
And there it is. I knew there was going to be water nearby. This right here is the drapery room. And that formation up ahead is called the Frozen Niagara. To be honest, this is my type of cave, the one that I like, you know, with stalactites and stalagmites. This is truly magnificent. Look at some of those delicate shapes. A little bit of night vision here to appreciate it better. This part here is fenced off to avoid further damage to the stalactites and stalagmites, which has been caused by us, people, visitors. So if you come to the cave, don't touch the stalactites, please. Thank you. All right, that was great, wasn't it? Here we wait for the bus that will take us back to the visitor center. At the visitor center, we have to go through some decontamination to avoid us spreading uh, some fungal spores that are causing other bats in other caves to die from something called the white nose syndrome. Parking lot is full now. It is time to continue on our journey. Here we take the Mammoth Cave Parkway to exit the park. Did you guys see the deer? Okay, let me rewind. Do you see it now? Huh, it actually looked a lot closer in real life. Let me slow down a little bit. I think it is time to get me a better GoPro and a better drone and a better tow vehicle for that matter while we're at it. Nah, we're doing just fine. Mammoth Cave Parkway becomes Mammoth Cave Road as we approach the town of Cave City. And the road is lined up with all kinds of places where you can do zip lining or buy rocks and they also have museums and there is so much to see here but we're not gonna stop anywhere. As you know, this is just an overview trip. I wish we had more time. We take I-65 because our sights are now a little further to the north in Bourbon country. We exit the interstate at Bonneville, Kentucky and we go east on State Route 728. We then go north on State Route 357 by Hammondville, which is listed as a populated place of about 2,000 people. I guess not dense enough to be called a town. Interesting. The person driving this van in front of us is going 30 miles per hour, seriously. And it looks like they are learning how to drive. So I'm going to try to pass him here. 
You see, I told you it was going to get a little more hilly as we went further northeast. We take State Route 84, also called Tanner Road, into the city of Hudsonville. It was near here that Abraham Lincoln was born back in 1809, although we are oblivious to the fact as we drive through the picturesque town. They actually even have a museum and a replica of the log cabin where Abe was born. And we will visit for sure the next time we are in the area. Riding with my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free in my RV. And we continue riding north on US 31E. A few miles down the road, we stumble upon Abraham Lincoln's boyhood home at Knob Creek. And here they also have a replica of the log cabin. They do have a museum and a trail, and I could have sworn I had taken more video, but as you can see, I'm walking empty handed, so I guess I forget. We continue on US 31E, also called the Bardstown Road, and it goes to, you guess right, Bardstown, the bourbon capital of the world. Speaking about bourbon, you will ask why are we wandering on the back roads of Kentucky? One main reason, as I told you, bourbon. We plan to visit the Maker's Mark Distillery, and if it seems we are in a hurry, well, we are. They close at 3.30 p.m. Here we are arriving in New Haven, which is a small city, just shy of 1,000 inhabitants. The day has turned kind of gloomy, so I hope it improves. Our range, a tow in Minitini, is just 180 miles at best, so often we have to put gas. So let's put gas here. While we're at it, let me take a quick video of this intersection. And this is one of those moments when I wish time wasn't an issue because I would love to explore this town. <laughs> and traveling in a camper van would help too. We could just park and walk around. From here, we continue due east. So far, I am totally in love with rural Kentucky. This is a part of our country I had never seen before. And it is that part that fits the stereotype of being quintessentially America. And nobody seems to be in a hurry. Back in Miami, people would have been blowing their horns a long time ago at these guys. We arrive at the picture-perfect Loretto, Kentucky, where the Maker's Mark Distillery is located, and that's our next stop. These black buildings are actually aging warehouses, and they are painted black to better warm up in the summer. However, there is a conspiracy theory going around saying that they are actually secret FEMA prisons. <laughs> this is such a picturesque area. One thing to note is that Google has no idea where the main entrance to this place is. And even though there are plenty of signs, I, like an idiot, when the Google lady says turn left, I turn left. Don't mind the no outlet sign. Now what do I do? Let's see how we can get out of this one and uh, make a U-turn somewhere here. All right, this might work. Uh oh, am I stuck? Yay, 
we've made it. It looks like this is a pretty new entrance and Google hasn't updated its maps yet. Now it looks like we are at the right place and we are ready to sample some spirits. They do have RV parking, that's very convenient. It looks like we have made it just in time for the last tour of the day. The tour, by the way, is $9 and they do have a free Wi-Fi throughout the facility, which is very convenient since there is no AT&T cellular coverage at the time of our visit, right here on May 31st of 2016. This is one of the most popular spots in the Bourbon Trail and I can see why. It is a beautiful property. Everybody else, we will be walking. We begin the tour by walking to the still house, and as we get closer, we feel what can only be described as the smell of fresh bread. In this first room that we visit, which is by the way very loud and very hot, a distilled alcohol is pouring into these uh, copper tanks. This also seems to be the control room. Apparently the main secret in Makers is the water, which comes from a nearby creek, Harding's Creek. Uh, this whole area of Kentucky has uh, iron-free, calcium-rich water, which is filtered by a very rich limestone shelf, which makes it perfect for making whiskey. And here, in these tanks, is where the fermentation actually takes place. CO2, that's all these little bubbles that you're saying. And it's a slow breakdown of grain sugar turning over to alcohol. Now the fun part, we're gonna taste it. Fingers in, fingers in. Come on, brave souls. Very sweet, very grainy. 24 hours from this point, it's gonna taste like a stale beer. By the end of day three, it's gonna look like packed grain. It kinda looks like cornbread before it gets baked. At the printing place, we get our own Maker's Mark label. Then we go into the barrel room. Now everyone, welcome to Warehouse A. This is one of our oldest and one of our smallest. Now this is where another big set of rules comes into being a bourbon barrel from any other type of spirit barrel. Has to be American white oak always. No other type of wood will do. Has to be a new constructed barrel every single time. After the barrel room, we walk into the bottling facility. Now the way the line works, we have two red tracks. Back track up at the top of the ceiling is bringing in boxes of empty bottles. On the other side of this red slide, there's two individuals there those shifts and they're going to flip that box over, push those bottles into the conveyor belt, start them on their process. First thing, let's do a glass enclosure. Every single bottle gets flipped upside down, whatever we're filling with. Finally, we get to taste some of this stuff and uh, at the end of the tasting, we get treated to a delicious bourbon chocolate. All right, so what we're looking at is called Spirit of the Maker. It was done by Del Chihuly. He's world renowned for glass blowing. Most people recognize his work from the Bellagio in Vegas. Now, he was actually asked to represent the making of Maker's Mark. So everything in here represents that. The greens and the yellows, the grains, the splotches of blue, the water in Kentucky that makes the bourbon great for us. At the end of the tour, I have to put all this safety gear because I am going to dip my own bottle into the signature red wax that seals every bottle of Maker's Mark. She's filming every bit of it too. Don't cut me anymore. Straight in, half way on the left. Straight out. Turn on inside. Spin as quickly as both hands. Alright. So you have half way on the left and spin. Yep. So straight in. Straight out. Turn on inside. Spin, spin, spin. Answer it up. Four out of five. Time to continue our journey, and I think we have made a wrong turn. 
The fact that Google gets easily confused around this area, paired with the lack of cellular coverage, is the perfect combination, and we get lost again. This seems to be the back of the distillery. Let's retrace our steps. The nice gentleman who gave us a ride back to the RV has obviously seen our ordeal trying to find our way and uh, tells us to follow him. We go back through Loretto and it is a beautiful afternoon now. Our next destination, Louisville. What a gorgeous day it is, compared uh, to the gloomy skies of a couple of hours earlier. We make a ride here right before the black warehouses onto State Route 49 North towards Bardstown. It is such a pretty countryside that it is hard to edit this down to a reasonable length. There has definitely been a lot of footage left on the cutting room floor, as they used to say in the film industry. It is almost certain that I'm going to do a deleted scenes video in the future. Maybe, maybe not. The next time we come, with more time of course, I think we are going to do the whole entire bourbon trail. The sight of all these uh, warehouses is a sign that we are arriving at the bourbon capital of the world, Bardstown. This is the Haven Hill Distillery, and uh, I may never understand the Google GPS algorithm, because it wants me to turn left here and then it takes me through all these back streets. Because I'm free in my RV, yeah, Eventually, we make it to Interstate 65 North, towards Louisville. It is time to change the GoPro battery. I don't want to miss downtown Louisville. And I have always had nothing but praise for our world-class interstate highway system, but I-65 coming into Louisville from the south leaves a lot to be desired. I know it snows up here and that's rough on the roads and there's a lot of construction, but come on people! Is it too much to ask for a smooth road? ground is actually on the other side of the river, in Indiana, a new state for us, so we are happy to see the sign. Our campground is the Louisville Metro KOA, and it had some bad reviews, but in our experience we have no complaints. It is very nice. It has a nice convenience store and clean laundry, and it is nice, it is what it is. By the way, Yelp is great, but sometimes asking the locals is even better. And they recommended we have dinner here, by the riverside, with this great view of downtown Louisville. This is the Buckhead Mountain Grill. 
we have the fried green tomatoes and the Kentucky hot brown, which is an open-faced turkey sandwich, a local delicacy, beautiful sunset, live music, tasty food and beer. What a great way to end the day. Don't want to get in trouble with the police. In the morning, my cousin Juan and his wife Thelma pick us up to give us a tour of the city. We begin with the downtown area. One thing is clear right off the bat. This town is all about college sports and horse races. The rivalry between the University of Kentucky Wildcats and the University of Louisville Cardinals is legendary. Here's the 4th Street Live, which is one of these new style downtown malls with lots of shopping, dining and entertainment. We are going south on 4th Street, into the old Louisville Historic District. The Historic District has the largest contiguous collection of Victorian mansions in the United States. And lots of churches, too. This is Central Park, at the heart of the Historic District. Here we turn on Magnolia Avenue, and towards the southern end of the park we encounter the St. James Court. It is actually officially the St. James Belgravia Historic District, and it is in the National Registry of Historic Places. On the first weekend of October, they hold a very popular arts and crafts fair here, called the St. James Court Art Show. The building at the end is called the Pink Palace, and rumor has it, it is haunted. Okay, let's have breakfast, and Cousin Juan has taken us to this place called Wagner's Pharmacy, which happens to be right next to the Churchill Downs stables, you know, where the Kentucky Derby takes place. The place has been a horseman hangout since the 1920s, particularly during Derby Week. Okay, let's go check out Churchill Downs, the home of the Kentucky Derby. They watched the race. Here we are passing by these tables, and here we get a glimpse of the actual building. The portion with the iconic twin spires dates back all the way to the 19th century. The recent Grand Stand expansions actually take so much away from the architectural beauty of the original structure. Let's go around towards the main entrance, and I never realized how much of a thing the Derby really is in this town. Here we are by the museum entrance, with the bronze sculpture of Barbaro, a legendary horse, six-time first place winner who shattered one of his legs in 2006 and eventually was euthanized after a year-long struggle with injuries and infections. Very sad. Picture time! Here we are with my cousin Juan and his wife Thelma. They do have a museum that we are not going to visit today. We step into this small garden with all these magnolias and a statue of Eight Bells, another famous horse. Here's also the final resting place of many famous horses. We steal a glimpse at what the people who actually paid for the tour are seeing, but we feel bad about crashing the tour, so we're gonna continue exploring Louisville. Here we are in the University of Louisville Cardinals turf, and I know my cousin happens to be a Kentucky Wildcats fan, so... <laughs> I don't patronize none of that. <laughs> I do, though. The University of Louisville, yeah. And these are houses that were built in the 40s. Boy, you gotta come here with more time. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> Definitely. Because they have a karaoke. It's been there for 100 years. My cousin Juan, he has lived here most of his life. Actually, he arrived here back in the 60s when he was a teenager. His wife, she was actually born and raised in Louisville, so they know the town pretty well. 
and Juan and I, well, we've only really met in person once or twice before. Uh, so along the drive, they share with us a lifetime of memories in this city, going back all the way to the 1960s. This is Barstown Road, and the neighborhood is called the Highlands. I used to live right there. Let's see what ma manager is. That little round there, yeah. that was my band right there. Oh, cool. Jack yeah. Fries. Jack Fries. All the big boxers used to come here. This was a box town, too. Mm -hmm. Do you remember where it is? I know more or less. The Highlands. It is famous for the number of bars and nightclubs in the area, as well as upscale fast food restaurants. This neighborhood is also referred to as the Strip, or Restaurant Row. As we go further from downtown, the neighborhood turns into a residential area, with very nice mansions, I might add. We are on Willow Avenue, in this upscale residential area near Cherokee Park. We are actually looking for this house where they throw a really big derby party with red carpet and everything. And it looks like one of this might be it, we're not sure. This was demolished by the tornado April 3rd. He's of course talking about the 1974 tornado outbreak, the largest ever recorded. And that's the statue of Daniel Boone that was destroyed. All the Cubans used to live right here, in this area. Austin, our grandson, went to school here. This is a Douglas Loop here, this is famous. This uh, twig and lift place has been an institution here for over 50 years. I want to take you to this little loop here. Nearby, we have uh, one of the three Havana Rumba locations, a Cuban restaurant that we will visit this evening. I am exhausted, probably from the long trip. In fact, while having a beer at uh, Juan's house, I just crash and uh, we decide to go back to the RV to recharge batteries and reconvene in the evening at Havana Rumba in the middle town area. After we take a nap, I fly the drone and let me give you a perspective of how close the RV park actually is to downtown Louisville. Right now, I am at Louisville, Kentucky. Tomorrow, actually, I am on the Indiana side of the river. But uh, tomorrow we continue north through Indiana.
And here we are, Havana Rumba. Here we are also joined by Juan's sister, my cousin Maria and her husband. So let's call it a family reunion. The food is delicious and the company even better. So nice to find the flavors, music and the warmth of family in the most unlikely of places. We shall return to Louisville with more time and that seems to be the recurring theme throughout the trip. Time or lack thereof. Hey! It may not seem like the safest of things, but I can never resist stopping and taking a picture with the state sign. And just like that, our time here in Louisville is coming to an end. Let me take one more picture of downtown from the Indiana side. Ooh, one more thing to see, the famous Colgate clock. Dating back to 1924, it is one of the largest mechanical clocks in the world, measuring 40 feet in diameter, almost twice as large as Big Ben. Louisvillians have a joke about the clock that goes. The Hoosers position the clock towards Kentucky because they can't tell time. Hoosers are referring to the Indiana people, of course. Okay, one more shot. I just couldn't resist. Thursday, June 2nd, we wake up to a slightly grayer morning here at the KOA doing laundry. In the morning, we walk to the falls of the Ohio State Park. The falls are really more like rapids, really. And even those have been mostly flooded behind the McAlpine Dam. There is a very large uh, exposed uh, fossil bed here, one of the largest in the world. Lewis and Clark. Oh, Lewis and Clark. Here they also have a statue of Lewis and Clark. It was near here that they departed on their great journey of exploration west, down the Ohio River. We walk back to the RV park because we must continue north, across the great state of Indiana. And I think we have already spent enough time here, in Indiana, that it merits another sticker on our map. It is time to continue on our journey north. We are leaving the Louisville Metro KOA in Clarksville, Indiana. And let me see how I can position myself here to put gas. My tank fill is on the right hand side, which is not the most convenient thing sometimes. And this is, of course, one of those old pumps that doesn't have a credit card reader. And I don't really feel like going inside. We still have about half a tank, so we'll top it up somewhere else. Today we are going to pretty much drive clear across the great state of Indiana, all the way from Clarksville to Elkhart, the RV capital of the world. Indianapolis, here we come! There is a lot of construction here on I-65 and let me tell you, it is not the smoothest of roads. Uh, let's get off here uh, by Henryville to put gas. I-65, as you can see, it is a pretty boring road around this area. Straight and flat and it looks like it might rain soon. We get stuck in traffic among all these semi-trucks. This seems to be the cause of all the delays.
After the traffic jam, well, it was expected we get some rain. But at least uh, the traffic is light now. Hmm. Traffic again. And all this heavy traffic we are encountering can only mean one thing. We are getting close to Indianapolis. There it is, in the distance, the downtown skyline. Let's get off the interstate and check it out. I'm riding, riding with my RV, wherever I want to be. Here's the Lucas Oil uh, football stadium, uh, which has a retractable roof and it's home to the Indianapolis Colts. To the left, we see the Citizens Thermal Energy Station, which was originally a power plant and it was later modified to produce steam, which is now used uh, to provide district heating to the downtown area. It is a very pretty downtown, isn't it? Here to the right we see the Indiana State Library and a little further down the Indiana State House, which is actually the Capitol building. Drive around a little more. We turn here on Meridian Street and in front of us we see the Soldiers and Sailors Monument, uh, built in the late 19th century. It was originally dedicated to the Hoosers veterans of the Civil War, although nowadays it also honors uh, veterans from other conflicts such as the Revolutionary War, etc. The monument has been added to the National Registry of Historic Places. Let's go around this pretty traffic circle. We exit the traffic circle, here is once again the state capital, <clears throat> I mean the Indiana State House. This is actually the fifth building to be called Indiana State House. Uh, the first one is preserved as a national landmark, uh, but the others have been either demolished or condemned. The statue in front of the building is of Oliver Morton, the Indiana governor during the Civil War. As much as I would love to explore this downtown area, uh, finding parking with Minitini in tow is going to be nearly impossible. Besides, we want to arrive at Elkhart before sundown. drive north, away from downtown, we encounter this building here to the right, which happens to be the Scottish Rite Cathedral, yeah, the Freemasons. And now that I think of it, we could have parked here to the left, but anyways, it is one of the largest Masonic buildings and one of the finest examples of neo-Gothic architecture in the United States. The road is a little rough around here as well, and as usual. I underestimated how much I was going to like Indianapolis. This should have been a month-long trip, not just a mere two weeks. We continue, speeding north across the great state of Indiana.
We get off the interstate uh, one more time, and uh, guess what we see? White Castle. We don't have those in Florida, so shall we partake? <laughs> I was actually looking for a mailbox here to mail some stickers, but I couldn't find one. Let's take US 31 North towards Kokomo. And what's up with all this traffic? I'm riding, riding with my RV, wherever I want to be, because I'm free. In my RV, yeah, I'm riding, 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 riding with my RV, my RV, wherever I want. To and let me tell you something: the Beach Boys were wrong. Kokomo is not in the Florida Keys. It is here in Central Indiana and home to many automotive factories. We just passed a Fiat Chrysler plant not long ago. There is a historic downtown, of course, and some other things to see, but we are just going to drive through. All these buildings on both sides of the road are manufacturing facilities for automotive parts and transmissions and all that good stuff. Eventually, we rejoin US 31 North. Let's put gas, and as you can see, some of these smaller gas stations are not really suited for a vehicle towing a travel trailer. We'll manage. Okay, let's switch. Right before South Bend, we take US 20 East towards Elkhart. And here we are. Finally, you can't really see it from the trailer camera, but as we approach town, we see several RV manufacturing facilities and dealers and suppliers. It is the RV capital after all. We turn right onto Franklin Avenue towards downtown. We are getting hungry, so let's hope we can find parking downtown. There's this place called the McCarthy's on the Riverwalk, Irish place, uh, that seems to be pretty good. It has good reviews, and I think we deserve a nice meal and a beer and a break after such a long drive. And here we are, downtown Elkhart. McCarthy's is just over the bridge. Okay, I see parking might be a little bit of a challenge. I don't want to take four of these parking spaces here, just in case. You know what? The bank across the street is closed, and I don't think they will mind. 
we are in Elkhart, Indiana. And I'm gonna drop off some stickers in the mail. Yeah. I hope we're good. We're okay to park here. Okay, time to eat. It is a very pleasant afternoon right here on the riverfront and there is a lot of pollen falling off the trees. The food is good, by the way. Okay, let's continue towards the RVMH Hall of Fame Museum, where the MH part, oddly enough, doesn't stand for motorhome, but instead it is short for manufactured housing. I always found that a little odd, but anyways, apparently you are allowed to overnight for free in the parking lot. Here we are. Unfortunately, this place is totally deserted and so out of the way of everything else that we don't really feel comfortable staying here all by ourselves. Let's go to the nearby Walmart and overnight there instead. This spot looks nice enough, doesn't it? Yeah, and I forgot to turn off the GoPro. Enjoy the time lapse. Yeah, our balance uh, fell victim to the bumpy roads of Indiana. But I think I've got a way to fix it. Voila! Always bring power tools with you. <laughs> Good morning from the Walmart parking lot here in Elkhart, Indiana. Today we are visiting the RVMH Hall of Fame, but before we do that, we are going to drive a short distance to the Michigan border. You know, to take a picture with the state sign. And here we are. To our left, Michigan. To our right, Indiana. We are on our way to the Recreational Vehicle and Manufactured Housing Hall of Fame in Elkhart, Indiana. A pilgrimage, really. A must-see place for any RVer at least once. Their mission, preserving the history and honoring the pioneers and individuals who have made significant contributions to the RV and manufactured housing industries. And you can actually park overnight here, but we decided to stay at the Walmart. First, we have the Go RVing Hall. And we begin with this uh, model of uh, an RV manufacturing plant. Here we see travel trailers and fifth wheels at different stages of manufacturing. And here we have a new Shasta trailer, its design reminiscent of the canned ham design of the 1950s and 1960s. This one, however, is quite nice inside and it has many of the modern amenities. Let's take a look at the original, a 15 foot 1954 Shasta. 1954 Shasta. By the way, no bathroom in any of these older units. Mm -hmm. 
Here we are inside another vintage trailer, an 1864 Mallard, 13 feet in length. And here we have a 2016 Winnebago Vista, 31 feet long. And the only reason I am showing you this actually is because if we ever wanted to go big, this would probably be it for us. I really like the floor plan <laughs> and I feel like I am at an RV show now. As you can see, it has ample counter space in the kitchen. And I guess they have this here to show how much RVs have really improved. This one has a couch and a TV in front of it which is such a simple ergonomic convenience that so many RV manufacturers overlook. Bunk bed over the cab. Many people say you shouldn't fixate on the floor plan, but I think it's very important, it's where you're gonna live. Holding tank capacity and storage are also very important, and this one has those too. It's a cougar. Fifth wheel. Let's move on and see a modern fifth wheel. Lots of flat slides out, lots of flat slide outs. And this is very, very much residential, as you can see. Well, we've seen them in the RV show, but might as well show you here. It's... It's not even in the house, although the kitchen is kind of rinky dinky. And then back here, of course. Very nice bathroom with lots of storage and the bedroom. Little pop up. Yeah, there's a happy camper wine. All right, let's move on to the main floor. And the first thing we see is a 1913 trailer, the oldest unit here. Commissioned by Mr. Earl, a botanist, who wanted a more comfortable tent with a pantry and a wardrobe, and something that he could pull with his Model T Ford. Next, here we have a 1915 Model T with what they called a telescope apartment, built in 1916. That's a slide out. <laughs> yeah, slide outs are not a new invention. 1916. Telescope apartment. Looks comfortable enough. It fits in the back of a Model T runabout. Skipping ahead here in the timeline, this is a 1958 22 foot Airstream Flying Cloud. And as you can see, this is very nice. It has a phone and a sofa, full kitchen. And it looks like a bedroom and a bathroom in the back. Too bad we cannot go inside. The heater has a chimney, just like the Kimberly Just Incredible has. Tent with wheels. This is a very cool looking unit is a custom made 1931 model AA Ford house car. The original seat was actually just a wooden bench. And look at all the amenities in the back of this Great Depression era motorhome. Very cool. Kimberly. Here's a look from the other side. Now here we are looking at a 1932 tent trailer, which had a very innovative pass-through icebox and pantry, so that you could access them, even if the tent was folded down. And here's a 1935 covered wagon trailer. A covered wagon was actually the largest manufacturer of trailers at the time. As you can see, well, things haven't changed all that much, have they? Except there is no bathroom yet. And this was the first travel trailer built by Fleetwood. Even in the 50s, some of these units were still rather simple. I mean, look at the size of that. Here we are inside a 1954 Holiday Rambler travel trailer, and we've got a fridge. Very cute, 
this uh, canned ham design trailers. I still find it baffling that none of these older units have bathrooms. To me, that's like the number one feature to have in an RV. Having your own toilet. Fifty-four Yellowstone travel trailer. Very cool. Nineteen fifty-seven teardrop. Now we are talking. But here we have jumped to 1985, a Fleetwood Bounder prototype, very similar to the iconic RV in the Breaking Bad TV series. 1985 Fleetwood Bounder. This was actually the first motorhome to have basement storage. That's the fridge, the medic. 1966 Mustang. Ooh, this one has a bathtub. This is a 1967, a couple of years before they didn't even include toilets and now we have a whole bathtub. I would call that progress. And now this is a Class C motorhome. It's actually pretty comfortable. It looks almost the way they look nowadays, sort of. Uh, check out the vintage panel though, very cool. The levels. <laughs> Bathroom in the back. 1978 Coachman Leprechaun Class C. Okay, this is really antique. And it has a bathroom. This is actually one of several vehicles built by Hollywood cinematographer and producer Roy Hunt in the 1930s. And this one is called the Star because of the hood ornament. A 1937 house car. It kind of looks like an old Citroen. 1937 house car. Fleetwood's first motorhome, 1969 Pace Arrow. Let's take a look inside. It is actually very nice. We could see ourselves living here. 1936 Road Home Coach. It has a bathtub. This is huge. This is a 1954 Spartan mobile home. It has like a real bathroom. Bunks. The oven. GE refrigerator. And then living area. All in here, 1954. Uh, they had the goal to call it a Spartan. Yep, the 18 by 42 feet long Spartan Imperial Mansion. Studebaker truck. And here's a very cool unit, built in 1988, using a 1976 Cadillac chassis and an Oldsmobile Tornado engine. It was designed to fit in a regular size car garage. 
And here we have the legendary 1935 Baulus Roadship, built out of riveted aluminum. It was created by William Holly Baulus, a sailplane and glider builder, and he applied the same aerodynamics he used to build planes. This unit is very light too, only 1100 pounds. Wally Byam, an employee of his, uh, took all this knowledge and went on to found Airstream. 1969, the precursor to the Class C motorhome. It was like a truck camper, just more integrated into the chassis. Mounted directly on the chassis with like that dash. Cool. This was made by the Stites Camper Company. Come over bed. A little wet bath. And living area. 1974 GMC, like the one uh, Wanderlust Estate travels in. Like the big windows. Yeah, this is nice. GMC And this is a class A motorhome any RV enthusiast will recognize. The original 1967 Winnebago motorhome. This was very cool. The GMC back there, the original Winnebago. All right, let's go. Outside the museum, uh, they have this 1977 Travco 32-foot Class A motorhome, based on a Dodge chassis. Rear AC has two AC units. In fact, it looks very much like a modern motorhome. Say that ten times. And with that, we say goodbye to the RVMH Hall of Fame. I hope you enjoyed it, but we're not done yet. We're going to Chicago. Chicago, pretty much the midpoint in our uh, epic road trip and the northernmost point of that trip as well. And by the way, beware, gas in Indiana is expensive. We just uh, filled up at what, 270 I think, 269, something like that. Granted it was at the service plaza so it was a little like 10 cents more than the regular gas station but buy everywhere. See you in Chicago. And we're stuck in traffic once again. Two miles before South Bend. They have a lane blocked off due to road construction. Okay, 
Let's get off Interstate 90. Cha-ching! $9.30 because of our four axles. Let's take I-94 West towards Chicago, but not so fast. A couple of viewers suggested that I visit the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, where on a clear day you can see the Chicago skyline across the lake. And today seems to me clear enough. There is a $6 fee to enter the park, and camping is $18 per night. I can see the lake, let's park and check it out. And it is true, there it is, Chicago, on the horizon. This is, by the way, Lake Michigan. So vast, it looks like an ocean. You know, I really wish we had added this place to our original plan. For one, I have never swum at a freshwater beach. I guess those must be the famous sand dunes. Okay, while I would have preferred to spend more time here, Chicago awaits. Let's find the, the dump station, you know, get our six dollars worth, because we are going to spend the next couple of nights dry camping in the windy city. Another toll, $1.70. We are going to take the Chicago Skyway. At the state line, we don't get a Welcome to Illinois sign. Instead, we just get a sign that says Welcome to Chicago. One last stall. This one is a whopping twenty dollars and twenty cents. Ouch. We've finally made it to Chicago. As we cruise along the Lakeshore Drive, we get treated to these spectacular views of downtown. The iconic silhouette of the Willis Tower, always present. Okay, everybody, pay attention. I am going to show you where to boondock for cheap here in Chicago. They make it sound difficult, but really, it is not. We are going to exit Lakeshore Drive right here at 31st Street and make a left on 31st Street. And then a right, but not here, on the next one, which is called Mo Drive. And that's it. Here we are. If you don't mind parking among all these trucks, it is $35 to overnight right here. We are planning on staying two nights, so it is $70. And eventually, we'll find a cozy spot right next to all these other RVs. Okay, don't tell anybody, but we actually got lost inside the McCormick Convention Center and couldn't find the exit. We even wandered down into the Metra station. Eventually, we get an Uber to downtown. We turn onto Michigan Avenue. This is the Art Institute of Chicago, very famous museum. And this, of course, Michigan Avenue, one of the most important and famous streets in the city. Here we have the Crown Fountain here in the Millennium Park. It has these uh, two very cool LED video screens. This area of the city is called the Loop. Yeah, I feel very loopy. And here we have another iconic landmark called the Cloud Gate, which is actually more colloquially known by everybody as the Bean. It is a great place for 
people watching actually <laughs> that's all the tourists are trying to take pictures of their reflection on this sculpture the sculpture was made by indian born uh, british artist anish kapoor there we are <laughs> okay let's go underneath the bean <laughs> this is pretty trippy <laughs> down here with all the reflections Cloud Gate. Very interesting. We are famished. And I had made this lengthy list of uh, dip dish uh, pizza places and hot dog joints. Uh, but when your stomach is doing the talking, you just type pizza on Google Maps and find the closest place. And that's what we did. There's uh, this wedding party taking pictures right here by the Millennium Monument. And the GPS has brought us here to Giordano's, which is a chain and is pretty touristy, but the deep dish pizza, in my opinion, is spectacular. Definitely worth the 45 minute wait. And before you ask, yeah, we ate the whole thing. In the shadow of these magnificent skyscrapers. Full belly, happy heart, let's continue exploring. This cool looking building is called the Aqua. I am very impressed with the Chicago architecture so far. In fact, right before sunset, we are going to take the Chicago Architecture Foundation River Cruise. This very ornate neo-gothic building is the Tribune Tower, home of the Chicago Tribune newspaper. By the way, there is this whole other underground city right here on the lower ground level. Pretty cool. I just can't get enough of this city. And here's a bust of Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, the founder of Chicago. He was born in Haiti, actually. Let's go down to the Riverwalk so we can board our cruise. All right, all aboard. So welcome to Chicago. So this is a great place to start our tour. Here's the 1920s Wrigley building, which was built to house the offices of the Wrigley Company, you know, the gum people. Trump Tower, second tallest building in the city. More about that one later. The John Hancock, the fourth tallest. We'll go there tomorrow. Also from the 1920s, once again, the beautiful Chicago Tribune. This is absolutely fantastic. And we're going west on the river. The skinny building is no other than the 1928 Mother Tower, which is a neo-gothic terracotta-clad skyscraper. The Jewelers Building Built in 1964, this is Marina City. Built as a city within a city, with many facilities within the complex. This pretty building to the left is the 1992 built 77 West Wacker Drive. The top floor, shaped like a Greek pediment. Very nice. And here's the historic Reed, Murdoch and Company building, dating back to 1914. As we see the elevated train passing in front of us, we see several buildings under construction in the background. One of them, the one with the parabola, is called River Point and is going to be 52 stories high. 333 West Wacker Drive, dating back to 1983, the green one. It actually looks newer than it is. And it is right here at the river bifurcation uh, where it goes north and south. The 
other building under construction is the 150 North Riverside Plaza. That one's gonna look nice when finished. We are now going north into a more residential area. sun sets, we turn around, going back south. The building with no corner offices is called the Montgomery. This bronze statue depicting goddess Diana is called the Spirit of Progress. There's the 333 West Wacker Drive again, the one with the green color. And now we are going to continue south towards the Willis Tower. And here's looking back. This building here apparently was pretty insignificant until one day they decided to put a map of the river on the facade. And this is River City, designed by Bertrand Goldberg, the same architect who designed Marina City. Also with the idea to create a city within a city. And I think we're gonna turn around here. Here's another view of River City. This building with all the balconies like in a pattern, it is rumored that there's a message encoded in the pattern of the balconies. Who knows? And there's once again the Willis Tower, formerly Sears Tower. It held the title of the world's tallest building for nearly 25 years, since its completion in 1974 until it was surpassed by the Petronas Towers in Malaysia in 1998. Now we are going back east, towards the lake, in the final portion of the tour. As night falls, the skyline looks even more beautiful. Here's once again the Trump Tower, the second tallest building in Chicago. The three setback features are designed to provide a visual continuity with the surrounding skyline, and each has the same height of a nearby building, like paying homage to the existing architecture. One fun fact about the Chicago River is that it used to flow east towards the lake, but the flow was so sluggish that there was a lot of pollution, so through a marvel of engineering they managed to reverse the flow of the river, way back in the early 20th century. What a view of the Chicago skyline! And there's that magnificent aqua building again. The guide points out the balconies, which seem to have no support. Very cool architecture. Well, that was a fantastic tour. 90 minutes long, and it's either $44 or $46 for the twilight tour that we just took. Now, let's walk a little along the Magnificent Mile, which is uh, this section of Michigan Avenue just north of the river. No great city can 
be complete without street musicians. Right here, in front of the Tribune building. Actually, let's step inside for a moment, see what it looks like. An interesting feature of the building are these uh, rocks from many important landmarks around the world. The Great Pyramid of Giza. Hey, we were just there. Okay, we are very much exhausted. So, let's go back to our luxury accommodations at the 31st Street lot. From our luxury accommodations here at the, what is it, the 38th Street lot at the McCormick Center in Chicago. Yeah, this place ain't pretty, but it sure is convenient. We walk a short distance to the lake shore, and what a view do we get. This is called 31st Street Beach, and there is a marina next door. We could have walked to the Willis Tower, uh, really, I mean, it's only four miles, but we decide to take an Uber because we want to get there early and avoid the crowds. are and al que madruga dios lo ayuda which is loosely translated from spanish as early bird gets the warm and we got it we get the sears tower with almost no lines welcome to the sky deck you're on your way to the top of the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Along the way, you can watch as we pass by some of the tallest buildings, monuments, and structures in the world. You're riding up this 1,450-foot modern marvel in one of the tower's 104 elevator cars. Your trip to the sky deck will only take about a minute. That means your elevator is traveling at a speed of more than 24 feet per second. The tower opened its doors in 1973 and held the title of the world's tallest building for 25 years. The west antenna reaches 1,730 feet above the Chicago streets. We're now passing 850 feet in San Francisco's Transamerica Pyramid, 970 feet in the Yokohama Landmark Tower, Japan's tallest building, 1,062 feet in Paris's stunning Eiffel Tower, the Bank of China Tower in Hong Kong, 1,250 feet in the Empire State Building in New York. And now we're here, 103 stories up. Welcome to the top. Here we are at the sky deck and at this sort of glass bottom balconies that are called the ledge. Do not come out here if you're afraid of heights. Let's go around, enjoy the sights. Here's uh, looking south uh, towards uh, River City. You know, the one that was a city within a city concept that we saw last night at the River Cruise. And here, let me zoom in on our parking lot. <clears throat> I'm sorry, our luxury accommodations. If you ever played Microsoft Flight Simulator in the 1990s, you will recognize that island right here. That was the site of Miggs Field, the, you know, the default airport where you took off from in the game. There's the John Hancock building. They do have an observation deck on the 94th floor called Chicago 360, and we might go there later. And there's our boat, the cruise from last night. I even caught a plane landing at Chicago O'Hare. And even on this gloomy day, Chicago has got to be one of the most stunning concrete jungles in the world. On a clear day, you can see up to 50 miles away from here, by the way. Let's walk around, which is, by the way, the best way to get to know a city. We even toy with the idea of riding on the elevated train, but ultimately decide against it. 
You know what? I need some coffee, you know me. <laughs> Gotta have my espresso. Oh yeah. We continue walking around. And here we stumble upon the Harold Washington Library, which actually looks a lot older than it really is. It only dates back to 1991. And in this area, there are a bunch of universities. Uh, the green, modern-looking building, for example, that's the Roosevelt University. Here we have the Congress Plaza Hotel. Although the building has gone through expansions and renovations several times, it originally opened for business back in 1893. Here we have one of the largest fountains in the world, the Buckingham Fountain. It is located in the center of Grant Park and it was dedicated in 1927. The fountain represents Lake Michigan. It has four sets of horses, symbolizing the four states that border the lake, which are Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan and Indiana. Just when we are beginning to have fun, it starts to rain. Luckily, it stops. We continue walking towards the Navy Pier along the shore of Lake Michigan. And here we encounter this curious fellas walking along the lake shore as well. There's uh, the new Centennial Ferris Wheel, opened in the spring of 2016. This is the famous Navy Pier. Inside, it feels very much like a tourist trappy shopping mall. So let's get a drink and continue. It feels like a tourist trap to me, but maybe I'm wrong. We'll continue. Not really interested. So instead of lingering here at the Navy Pier, we are going to engage now in an activity many people have recommended. There happens to be a baseball game at Wrigley Field, so why not? We don't actually have tickets to the game, but it should be fun to see the stadium and the surroundings anyways. Even though we don't go inside the stadium, even under the rain, the energy all around, the atmosphere, is electrifying. Especially at the sports bar. I actually think this is even better than going inside the stadium. Even though I have never been a hardcore sports fan, baseball happens to be the one sport I truly enjoy. One of my earliest memories in life was sitting on my grandpa's lap back in Cuba, watching the ball game on the old black and white Soviet-made TV. And it is the seventh inning stretch, so let's all sing. Two, three strikes, you're out at the... <laughs> so much fun. It's like the whole neighborhood participates and, and the excitement is palpable and contagious.
Actually, I kind of wish I was in there, inside the stadium. Here's the iconic sign with the score, so I gotta take a picture. Alright, let's get out of here. It is a very pretty neighborhood. It kind of reminds me of San Francisco a little bit. And we are back in the downtown area. We are at the Hancock building and there is no one here. Weird. This is where the other Great Observation Deck is located, the 360 Chicago. 94th floor. I can see why it's kind of empty. The weather is not exactly at its best. There's the Navy Pier down there. And I like the fact that this building is closer to the lake. The presence of water adds to the whole experience, I guess. The views should be spectacular, at least as great as from the Willis Tower, if it wasn't such a rainy, hazy day. I can see our campground, <clears throat> parking lot, I mean luxury accommodations, <laughs> and the afternoon is slowly clearing up. And down there, that's the Chicago Water Tower. We'll go there next. Okay, one last look down the magnificent mile. I just can't get enough. And the Navy Pier, now that the sun wants to come out. They have this new attraction called the Tilt, and it works as advertised. You know, they tilt you so you can look down. And here's the famous water tower, the second oldest one in the country, uh, built in 1869. It was one of the few buildings that survived the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 and is now a symbol of old Chicago. Serendipity takes us to this restaurant called Rosebud on Rush Street. By far the fanciest meal of the whole trip. We are kind of beat. I think we are going to go back to Minitini and take a break. We definitely don't have as much stamina or endurance anymore. It was a fun day though. Okay, one quick flight to show you where we are. I'm not even sure if I'm supposed to fly here, so I'll make it quick. In the morning, we decide to go for a stroll on the lakefront trail. The trail seems to be very popular with morning joggers. And wouldn't it be nice to have a sailboat? Don't worry, we are not going that route, at least not yet. But it would be nice. Seems like a lot of work though. There it is, the Chicago skyline. As we approach uh, this marina, the Burnham Harbor, I wonder if that's the old air traffic control tower from when this used to be an airport. <laughs> the money pit, that's funny. There's a cute little boat in between these two. 
the aquarium. This building here is the Shed Aquarium. It is a very nice neoclassical building representing a Neptune's temple. And there seems to be a cancer awareness run or something like that. And look at this view we get from the aquarium. This is probably, hands down, one of the best vantage points to take that Instagram perfect picture of Chicago. Almost next to the aquarium we have the Field Museum, which apparently has the world's largest T-Rex and many other exhibits. Another time, perhaps. We are going to walk west on Roosevelt Boulevard. Someone has recommended we go to this fast food hot dog place called Portillo's. And what happens when you arrive at a hot dog joint and you don't feel like having a hot dog? Well, you order something else, like this Italian sandwich that looks so pretty in the advertising. We'll have the legendary Chicago hot dog some other time. This guy has some serious road rage. Nos vamos! Time to leave our luxury accommodations here at the McCormick Center Truck Marshalling Lot. Our time here was short, but very well spent. And I think it was long enough for us to fall in love with Chicago, one of the great American cities. The GPS, of course, lies. Or maybe we made a wrong turn, I don't know, but somehow we end up in the underground bowels of the McCormick Center. This lady, she sounds like she wants to kill me for going in the wrong direction. And here I have to back up, you know, pretty much blind, with big buses behind me. Note to self. Get a rear-facing camera. I won't bore you with the long, uneventful drive south. Just the two of us enduring it is enough for one day. It's the world's largest ketchup bottle! This is actually located here in Collinsville, Illinois just about 15 miles east of St. Louis, and it is considered a great example of 20th century roadside Americana, this particular contraption here dating back to 1949. Okay, I know East St. Louis is supposed to be a pretty rough town, but come on, the police department being our welcoming committee? That was uncalled for. I don't know, it kind of gives me the creeps. Anyways, here we are. East St. Louis, Illinois, St. Louis, Missouri, on the other side of the Mississippi. 
we are going to stay right here at the Casino Queen RV Park. And this is not a very attractive entrance, but doesn't matter. Since it is after hours, the security guard uh, checks us in and uh, lets us choose whatever site we want on this side. Unlike other casinos that let you boondock for free, uh, this one has an actual RV park in the back and it is not cheap. $59 per night for what is basically a parking lot with hookups, but hey, it is a fine location right next to downtown St. Louis. We are in pretty desperate need of a long shower, so let's relax and unwind at the casino and tomorrow, well, tomorrow we'll go downtown. Recognize that? Well, yeah, that's the Gateway Arch and that means we have arrived in St. Louis. We're going to see the arch. Good morning. This building that looks like a capital building, it is not. It is the old courthouse. And there's the Gateway Arch, which is where we're going to go first. We're going all the way up there. They have all these markings on the street showing the way. Very thoughtful. Lewis and Clark, we're here. Oh, very important, you must purchase the Arch tickets in advance at the old courthouse. Don't just show up at the Arch because they won't let you in, they're gonna make you go back. What a marvel of architecture and engineering this is. It is, by the way, the world's tallest arch and the tallest man-made monument in the Western Hemisphere. There's the, the mighty Mississippi River, a large barge being pushed upstream. And it looks like they have riverboat cruises too. Another time, perhaps. Well, this place requires no introduction. As you can see, we are at the Gateway Arch here in uh, St. Louis, Missouri. And the mighty Mississippi River behind us, and that back there, that's the casino where we're staying at. Huh. Let's go up to the arch. It's kind of a bummer that there is so much construction everywhere. But I'm sure it is going to be great when they're done. Here's a cutaway picture of Mark Twain as we approach the tram. And here we are. We are going into pod number five. Pretty tight quarters. This unique tram system has more in common with a ferris wheel than an elevator, really. Notice that at first we are going diagonally towards the base of the leg and then we go almost straight up. It is almost like a regular elevator in this part. As we approach the top, we start slowly going more and more diagonally again. There are eight of these pods in each leg, and each of them can carry up to five people. We've made it to the top, and as you can see, it can get a little bit crowded up here. Let's try and get to a window and... Wow! What a view, the shadow of the arch in downtown. And here's the moment when my 4K camera starts malfunctioning. Something is off with the lens, it goes out of focus when I use the zoom and it's making a strange noise too, and we gotta figure that one out. Can you spot Minitini in the parking lot? The bridges crossing the Mississippi. And it kind of sucks not being able to use the zoom, you know, but... Anyways, to the east, Illinois. To the west, Missouri. And there's Bush Stadium, home of the St. Louis Cardinals. Okay, let's get in line to go back down. And it is a pretty long line. Down and 
down and down we go. Notice how we gradually change direction as we descend from the arch. A pretty unique quote-unquote elevator and I personally find it fascinating. The legs of the arch are actually equilateral triangles and the shape of the arch, imagine a chain hanging but imagine it upside down. That shape apparently is called a catenary and supposedly makes the arch structurally very stable. So those of us who thought it was a parabola, technically we were wrong. We were all the way up there. Man, I've gotta get this camera fixed, so, so frustrating. We came at a bad time with all this construction going on. It is such a beautiful day though, and don't mind the construction. Mother Nature sure did us a solid today. Let's continue. This church here with the bells tolling, it is the Basilica of St. Louis, the oldest building in the city. In 1945 it was 100 years old. Well, let's step inside for a moment. We are walking towards Bush Stadium and there's this place here called Ballpark Village. It is right in front of the stadium. Uh, you know, it is like a mall with food and drinks and entertainment. Actually, very nice. Let's go into the Budweiser Brew House. You know, I have never really been a big Bud fan, but when in Rome, like they say. <laughs> All right, let's continue. It's not a lively downtown. Normally, this is the site of a beautiful park. And it will be again, I'm sure. It looks like I might be able to take some nice shot from the roof of our parking garage. Let's take out the video camera. There's the arch, and the old courthouse again, and the construction site. The nice lady at the RV park actually advised us not to drive to downtown, to take the shuttle to the train station instead, but really? I don't know what she was talking about because this is really easy driving. Maybe she thought we were foreign tourists, I don't know. But I guess after driving in Miami every day, with some exceptions of course, everything else uh, seems pretty easy in comparison. By the way, do you see anything wrong with this picture? It is Monday, 2 p.m., downtown, in a relatively large city. Doesn't it seem awfully quiet and almost eerily deserted? We have also been googling my camera issues and it is apparently pretty common uh, with Sony camcorders. Something inside the lens falls out of alignment and I think we found the solution with the lens facing up. Give the camera a gentle whack in the back where the battery is and it supposedly well, snaps back in. This pretty building to the left that sort of looks like a castle, well that's the old St. Louis Union Station, nowadays converted into a luxury hotel. Guess what, I gave my camera a gentle whack against uh, the center console and yes, my zoom is working again. Uh, don't tell Sony, it might void my warranty. Where to next? Well, I'll give you a hint, there's beer. If you guessed Anhauser Busch, St. Louis, Missouri, you guessed right. That's where we're going. Okay, first things first. Let's go into the beer garden. There's not a whole lot of people at this time. And actually, they do have a pretty decent selection of beer, not just Bud. But we are here, so let's get a Budweiser Select. 
They have this area with a mural illustrating the history of the brewery since the mid 1800s. They also have this display with the different malts they use. And um, here's uh, the beer making process. I think we are just going to sign up for the complimentary tour, uh, which lasts about 45 minutes. That's long enough. And did I mention it's free? <laughs> we begin by walking to the Budweiser Clydesdale stables. Uh, these magnificent beasts, uh, they have been like a symbol of the Anheuser-Busch brand since mm, memorial times. Originally used for transportation to make sure a fresh beer was delivered in a timely manner. The stables date back to 1885. Where are the horses? Not on this side. That's there, all over there. Here he is. Why are you looking at me that way? Well, I missed uh, most of the explanation about the history and significance of this place, just taking pictures of the horses. Oh well, let's continue. Here we see part of the pipe network that moves the beer around from building to building. Very cool. We're going to the cold cellar where beer is aged and fermented in these large tanks and then filtered afterwards. <laughs> Next, we walk towards the brew house on this lovely summer day. And here we get a lecture on why this is the best beer in the world, and we get to try a sample. We walk into the famous brew house building, uh, dating back to 1892. It is particularly notorious uh, for the nice ironwork and the multi-story chandeliers and the use of natural light. Let's go down into the lower level. There's a painting there of some importance, but I didn't catch what it was. Well, that was a great tour. And guess what? We get another complimentary beer at the end. It being our second one here, I opt for a Bud Light. Hi, thank you. Time to continue exploring St. Louis. And here they have one of the Clydesdales at the entrance. And as you can see, they cut off the, the hair in the tail and they put like a little bow, which honestly doesn't look very dignified to me, but tradition. Well, we've had two beers, well, actually three, on a pretty empty stomach, so we better eat something quickly. And St. Louis is famous for its barbecue, so that's what we're going to do. There are many places to choose from, uh, but we are going to go to Papi's Smokehouse, which seems to be one of the most famous ones. And uh, here we are. We are going to share a full slab, which is $23.99, and while we wait, let's check out all this stuff they have here. That's about the best barbecue I have ever had. Now, it is time for dessert. 
have you all noticed the prevalence of the brownish reddish color everywhere around this city like the red brick buildings and even the pavement has like a reddish hue it's interesting anyways i digress uh, we are going to have some frozen custard for dessert hey that's again the inhauser bush uh, building to the left I don't know if you've noticed too, but lately Google Maps loves to take us on all these secondary residential streets and the GoPro battery died. In 600 feet, turn right onto South Grant Boulevard. The neighborhood has a little bit of a sketchy reputation when it comes to crime rate, but don't be dissuaded by that. The frozen custard is to die for, not literally. If you see someone threatening you, run. You are on the fastest route despite some traffic. You should reach your destination by 5.28 p.m. Yeah, I think the GPS is lost. And another day comes to an end, here in East St. Louis. Well, I think it is most appropriate that we add an Illinois sticker to our map. And why not? Let's do Missouri too. Good morning! Today we are continuing on our journey, now towards Memphis, Tennessee. And for the first time, we are taking Mini Tini the trailer west of the Mississippi River. Very exciting! It is going to be a long, long, long drive. Uh, four hours according to the GPS, but with Mini Tini in tow, that's more like five or six. And we have to have lunch at some point, so may the journey continue. The plan is to stay at the Tom Sawyer Mississippi River RV Park, which is actually on the Arkansas side of the river, so yet another sticker for our map coming up. We are going to stop uh, briefly here at the Walmart Supercenter in Cape Girardeau, a little over two hours into our trip, and what do you know, they sell hard liquor at the Walmart. <laughs> Sorry, got excited. <laughs> Let's fill up and continue. We are really close to the Mississippi River, and it's not a very busy highway, so I may have a good chance to kill two birds with one stone and take pictures with both the Illinois and the Missouri state signs. I haven't been able to do this too yet. Okay, let's go back to Missouri. Coming up next, lunch. 
Interstate 55 goes straight as an arrow for 23 miles. We are going to this place called Lambert's Cafe in Minor, Missouri, home of the throat rolls, and it is true, they actually have a guy throwing bread at you. Let's see if I finally decide where to park. Okay, let's eat. Here's our throat roll, and the portions are humongous, and so are the drinks. And just when you thought you couldn't eat more, eh, they come around with extra sides. This is way too much food. Cheers. And as much as I tried, I couldn't get video of the guy throwing the rolls. I was too busy eating. Yes, it is uh, one of those places with lots of stuff on the walls, and uh, old artifacts and uh, contraptions all over the place, and the food was great, by the way. We ate way too much, and we still have 140 miles to go, and let's face it, it is going to be a boring drive south on Interstate 55. There's no other way to put it. Oh boy, and I thought Florida was flat. But don't despair, there are some highlights on this segment of the trip. The first one, of course, is arriving in Arkansas, a new state for us, and you know we gotta stop for the requisite picture. Next we go into the visitor's center, and they have free coffee, very important, and the information about the state and the nicest lady with the strongest Arkansas accent you can imagine. Also, another really cool thing that happened, at some point someone passed us and recognized us and put this picture on Instagram. Very cool, thank you, Mom Life Vibes. Check out the crap duster. We arrive at Tom Sawyer's RV park, and uh, they are going to take us to our site now. Okay, right off the bat, I don't think we are going to be entirely fair to Memphis in this video. We are extremely tired from our almost two-week-long action-packed road trip. And uh, to be honest, our expectations are kind of high and our spirits hmm, kind of low. That being said, let's do it. Yes, I requested a riverfront site. I have always been fascinated by the Mississippi River and Mark Twain's stories. I can almost imagine seeing Jim and Huck's raft coming downstream any minute now. Shall we fly? We can definitely see downtown Memphis in the distance. The camera doesn't really capture it well, but there's a swarm of birds flying around the drone constantly. At one point I was even afraid that they would attack it and make it crash, but I still got some beautiful shots of our RV park and the mighty Mississippi. Although we are tired from the long trip, we are going to explore Memphis a little bit tonight. We cross the historic Memphis-Arkansas bridge, and here to the right we see the Tennessee state sign. Maybe I should take a picture here later. We arrive at downtown, kind of disoriented. We know there's this famous Beale Street here to the left, but not much more. 
We should have done more research, definitely. Let's just park right here and explore on foot. We walk south on Main Street and then west on Union Avenue towards the river. Raptor! We walk along the riverfront and get treated to this beautiful sunset over the Mississippi River. Let's go up Beale Street to see what's going on and yes, Elvis is still alive in this town, at least in spirit, at least for us tourists. Rock and Soul Museum. We are approaching the Beale Street touristy area. This is one of those places where blues music originated back in the late 1800s. After one, Robert Church purchased the area, developed it, and actually became the first black millionaire from the South. The area continued developing as a musical mecca during the first half of the 20th century, and anybody who was anybody in the world of jazz and blues played here. This right here is a statue of William Christopher W.C. Handy, a composer and musician known as the father of blues. Nowadays, the city of Memphis pretty much manages and keeps Beale Street alive as a major tourist attraction here, with many bars and, as you can see, live music, in some way preserving the street's rich musical history. The original idea was to hang out here and party like it was 1949, but we are pretty pooped. And not in the mood, really. Let's drive around a little more, and I apologize for the dirty windshield. It didn't look nearly as bad in real life. We've heard of this area called Cooper Young in Midtown Memphis, around the intersection of those two streets, which is supposed to be like a happening neighborhood, but it being a little late on a weekday and unbearably hot. I guess <laughs> there's not a whole lot going on. We'll come perhaps some other time during the day. Up ahead is the 100-year-old Cooper Young Railroad trestle, which now has a sculpture of homes and businesses of the neighborhood. Okay. Let's call it a night. Tomorrow should be action-packed. Good morning from Tom Sawyer's Mississippi River RV Park. Nothing like some coffee to begin your day. And we have two kinds. Yes, it is a very pleasant morning here on the western bank of the Mississippi. Room with a view. Here's a pusher boat pushing a large barge upstream. All right. Let's go to Memphis. Once again, we go across the river, and this time I am going to take that picture with the Tennessee sign for my future intro. By the way, today we are going to Graceland to visit the king. Ever since I was very young, I always heard about this mythical place where the king of rock and roll used to live. 
is alive. They have a very comprehensive tour on an iPad, uh, which is very well implemented, actually. I think they are using some kind of iBeacon technology because the iPad knows your location within the house. Very cool. Here's the living room, as it would have looked perhaps in the late 50s. Very classy. And I apologize in advance for the slideshow. They didn't allow video recording, and I guess I am becoming a rule follower in my older years. <laughs> Scary thought. Here's the mother's room and the dining room. Actually, some rooms are decorated in 1950s style, while others span to the 60s and 70s. Here's the kitchen, for example, as it looked in the mid-70s. He even had a closed-circuit TV security system. Here's the downstairs living room, also called the TV room. Because when Elvis heard that President Lyndon Johnson watched all the three networks at the same time, well, the king had to have it too, right? And here's the billiard room, uh, all draped in this pleated fabric. It looks to me like a nightmare, but that's how Elvis liked it. Next, we step into the jungle room, with its green shagged carpet. Elvis liked it particularly, because it reminded him of Hawaii. We continue on to the office, where Vernon, Elvis's father, managed the business. Here's a model of Elvis Presley's birthplace in Tupelo, Mississippi, and we might visit that soon. Elvis's beloved horses. Here we are at the Trophy Building. There's all kinds of memorabilia here, the wedding dress, the clothes he wore at his comeback 1968 TV special, and suits he wore at different shows. The handball court, with the pinball machine, and this lounge, and the last piano he ever played, just hours before his death. Finally, we step into the meditation garden, where Elvis and members of his family are laid to rest. Elvis Aaron Presley, January 8, 1935 to August 16, 1977. Next, we're going to visit Elvis's custom-designed planes. This right here is the Lisa Marie, named after his daughter. He bought her in 1975. It is too bad he didn't get to enjoy it for a very long time. In 1975, he also bought this smaller plane, the Hound Dog 2. There are all these other rooms all over the property with all kinds of memorabilia. And then there's the car museum. I'm sorry, the automobile museum. And you know, Elvis liked fast cars. That was his thing too. Here's a 1975 Dino Ferrari and the Blue Hawaii pink Jeep. There are over 15 cars here that he owned. The 1973 Stutz Black Hawk. And the most famous, Pink Cadillac. By the way, the planes and the cars are part of the Platinum Package, which is very expensive, but hey, we're going to do this once in our lives. Time to go. Worth mentioning, the Heartbreak Hotel. All this Elvis memorabilia has gotten us hungry, so let's go for some Memphis barbecue. And we've heard of this place called Central Barbecue. We are going to go to the one in downtown.
Here we opt for some craft beer and the full slab, which is $21.99, half wet, half dry. And while it wasn't perhaps as good as the one in St. Louis, it was still really good. I mean, it is really hard to decide which is best. You see that shiny object in the distance? Well, that's where we're going next, the Memphis Pyramid. Originally conceived as a basketball arena, nowadays it is a Bass Pro Shops superstore. It is the 10th largest pyramid in the world. The original idea of building a pyramid here came from the name of the city, Memphis, which was also originally the ancient capital of Lower Egypt, hence the pyramid. Inside it is very similar to other Bass Pro Shops, just dialed to 11, really over the top. Yes, here they have the tallest freestanding elevator in the United States, going to the top of the pyramid. And from the top, we get these amazing views of Mud Island and uh, the Mississippi River, the Hernando de Soto Bridge, Is it me, or does the traffic seem light for a Wednesday afternoon? Is there no traffic in any of these Midwestern cities? Maybe I should move here. Is that a helicopter chasing a plane? <laughs> Optical illusion, I'm sure. Okay, let's go! We are back at Tom Sawyer's RV Park. Hey everybody, it's a beautiful day here in uh, Memphis, but I think we're gonna continue south a little earlier than anticipated. Uh, last night the bugs here were epic, and really. Uh, tomorrow was going to be one of our longest driving days of this trip, and we're gonna cut it short by about two hours, so we're gonna try to go southeast towards uh, Tupelo, Mississippi and maybe tomorrow in the morning we'll be able to see uh, Elvis Presley's uh, birthplace although I think we've seen enough Elvis <laughs> anyways, let's hit the road alright, let's add the Arkansas sticker to our map and be on our way you see, I told you at the beginning this was not a fair overview of Memphis not by a long shot we are nearing the end of our road trip it is very, very hot, and I think we are suffering a little bit from a post-Chicago syndrome. You know, every city is going to feel a little underwhelming after that, but... We also spent too much time at Graceland, and that kind of wore us out. Let's fill up the tank and drive south. We 
we arrive at the Mississippi state line and uh, it is almost night time so it is kind of hard to get a good shot with the phone. We drive into the night, southeast on Interstate 22. About two hours later, we arrive at the Walmart in Tupelo, Mississippi. Good morning! And since Elvis has been one of the main subjects of this video, <laughs> might as well visit the king's birthplace, which is very close. Here we are. It was in a car like this one, in 1939 Plymouth, that the Presley family moved from Tupelo to Memphis on November 6, 1948, and hmm, the rest is history. And this is the house that Vernon Presley, Elvis's father, built in 1934 with the help of his father and his brother. Elvis would be born a year later. January 8, 1935. The house has been restored to its original condition and they do offer tours, but they're not open yet. Around the house they have all these plaques on the floor describing different events in Presley's life. Very interesting. There is also this statue of Elvis at 13. Very careful consideration was taken to figure out his likeness through period photographs, his height and the clothes he might have worn as a poor boy in the south. This church from Elvis's childhood has been moved here because it was a pivotal moment in his formation as a musician. Blending the blues with the country, pop and gospel. Many of the first songs Elvis recorded for the Sun label in Memphis were covers of earlier blues recordings by African Americans and he continued to incorporate blues into his records and live performances for the remainder of his career. Here he was exposed to southern gospel music, which became a staple in his musical repertoire. It was here that he learned his first guitar chords from the Assembly of God minister brother Frank Smith. It is all very well maintained and I would actually like to stay until they open but at the same time the road is calling. We are anxious to continue on our journey south. Next stop, the Florida Panhandle. Although I've lived in Florida most of my life, I have never actually been to the Panhandle. I went through it once in 96 on the way to New Orleans, but now we are going to visit and enjoy the crystalline waters of the Emerald Coast. And yeah, it is a pretty dull drive for the most part. After a while we start seeing some rolling hills and soon we make it to sweet home Alabama. Yeah, another state and it is a nice song, sweet home Alabama. We continue on to the heart of the deep south. We start seeing more hills as we approach the Cumberland Plateau at the southwestern end of the Appalachians. As we approach Birmingham, Alabama's largest city, we change course, now due south on Interstate 65. We zoom through downtown Birmingham and continue relentlessly on our journey south. Is that a rainbow in the sky or some kind of optical illusion? It certainly hasn't rained. A couple of hours later, 
we make it to Montgomery, the state's capital, and we are going to get off the interstate here to see a little bit of it. We are cruising along Bibb Street and then Madison Avenue. Well, we have to at the very least pass by the Alabama House on Capitol Hill, listed in the National Registry of Historic Places as the first Confederate capital. And uh, here it is, to the left. Let's continue. Florida awaits. There's no interstate from here to Destin, so the straightest and fastest way is through some of these less important roads. This is US 55 South. We continue on US 29. And then on to Alabama 137, very close to the Florida border now. I don't know why the GPS took us this way, actually, there seems to be another faster, straighter way, but <laughs> who knows? Look at the sign, look at the sign! We are now in Florida. Yeah, it is a small sign. Anyways, here we are, and for the next two days we are going to take, if you will, a vacation from our vacation, enjoying the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Destin, here we come! We are going to spend the next two days here on the Emerald Coast, on the Florida Panhandle, near Destin. Actually, let's make a left here towards Panama City. We encounter all this heavy traffic as we arrive at the Barrier Island and, to be honest about it, after a couple of days in the Midwest, we are not really used to this anymore. How quickly does one forget how frustrating traffic can be? We are staying here at Camp Golf, which is on Miramar Beach, just a little bit east of Destin. By the way, this is one of the most expensive RV parks in the whole United States. Are you sitting down? Our two nights here, granted it is a beachfront site, but anyways, they are a grand total of $445 after taxes, and I had to reserve months in advance. I actually got the last available beachfront site. But wait, wait till you see it, it is fantastic. We actually even changed our travel plans just to be able to be here, and I sure hope it is all it's cracked up to be. This is, of course, a luxury, one we couldn't possibly afford to do too often. This is one of those things you do at least once in your RVing life, well, maybe twice. So let's live a little and enjoy this unique opportunity. As you can see, it is really, really busy, always. By the way, this is one of those RV parks with a whole booklet of rules and regulations and a 4.5 mile per hour speed limit. We have to wait here for this guy to back up his trailer. And here we are. What did I tell you? Our site is right on the beach. These beach sites are not full hookup, for obvious reasons, but for 10 extra dollars they have a honey wagon service to empty your tanks. Yeah, they nickel and dime you for everything. Riding with my RV, my RV, wherever I want to be. Because I'm free in my RV. Well, we have made it to the Emerald Coast. Dustin, check it out. It's a beautiful afternoon. All right, cue the reggae music. This is some of the whitest and finest sand in the world. Hello. The sand here is actually made up of small uh, quartz particles. Very interesting. This is the life I'm telling you. This has to be 
hands down the best beach I have ever been to in the United States. That good. sunset coming up. Anyways, we're gonna get something to eat. Awesome. This is the view from our roof. Isn't this fantastic? Stay right here on the beach. In the evening, we drive a few miles west to Destin proper and they're having fireworks and I wonder what the special occasion is. We're going to eat here at the Boathouse Oyster Bar. They do have uh, live music and great ambience. They have all these dollar bills stapled to the roof like, you know, the no-name place in the Florida Keys, same concept. They claim to serve the best gumbo in Destin and it is outstanding. It even has like actual crab legs inside. The fish is good too, by the way. Very satisfied. We would love to linger, but we are bit. We are not spring chickens anymore. Let's drive back to Camp Golf. I stay up late at night, experimenting with some long exposure photography. I even try to write Destin in the air with my red flashlight. And there are people, you know, with flashlights walking along the beach, uh, looking for something in the sand. I wonder what it is. Well, good night. Good morning. It is such a privilege to wake up to this. Okay, let's fly and see all this from above. It is so beautiful. White sand as far as the eye can see.
We spent the rest of the morning frolicking in the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. This fish seems to have taken a liking to me. Go little fishy, go! Actually, there are fish everywhere and the water is so clear. We also catch some rays and look how much sand we have tracked inside Mini Tini. Okay, let's enjoy the water a little more. I am still amazed at how clear the water is. Let's also catch some waves. I'm falling, <laughs> they can't get up. Oh gosh. I love the beach. This is the life, I'm telling you. And there you see our two blue chairs, reserving our little piece of beachfront real estate. We are going to have lunch at this place called The Back Porch. We have a beer at the bar while we wait for our table. And yeah, it is fantastic. this is the view from our table. Worth the wait. Don't we look like we are having a great time? Well, we are. Our gombo arrives, which is uh, quite good, actually. And the fish sandwich and we eat while enjoying this magnificent view. Yeah, life's good. They have a water park here called the Big Kahuna. Let's take uh, the scenic route as we drive back to Camp Golf. We pass by all these beachfront mansions and condos. Miles and miles of white sandy beach. We're back. Well, some people get really serious about their sand castles. As you can see, it is getting a little choppier in the late afternoon. And just like that, another day comes to an end. Bad weather coming our way tonight. It rains through the night and into the morning. 
Actually, I wanted to go for a morning dip, but it is fine. Oh boy. We're leaving. All right, let's get out of here. But before we hit the road for real, we're going to cruise along the Emerald Coast a little bit more. Actually, I want to go all the way to Panama City. I've always wanted to see it. Uh, so stay with me here a little longer. It ain't over until I sing. And I ain't singing yet. It's pretty flooded, huh? All that rain last night. We are going to empty our holding tanks here. The dump station is actually pretty disgusting. Someone threw some rotten potatoes into it. I know that's not really the park's fault, but some people just don't care about the person coming after. There's also a line to come out because some guy just stopped to rinse his RV. Again, people, be considerate. We start driving east on the Florida Panhandle. We get a little bit of rain here and there. Actually, let's put some gas. We may not get a nice big gas station until we hit I-10. You never know. The GPS lady wants me to stay here on US Highway 98, but I want to take the scenic route, whatever it is. So we turn here onto County Highway 30A by Topsail Hill State Park. And here we are in picturesque Santa Rosa Beach. Here the road separates once again from the coast, but I am determined to continue hugging the white shores of the Gulf of Mexico, so I make a ride here. Let's see where this road takes us. Blue Mountain Road. <laughs> Mountain in Florida. <laughs> How funny. You know, maybe this is not as RV friendly as I thought around here. Actually, maybe I shouldn't have taken this route at all. Let's go back. Oops, made it worse. Let's go back onto County Highway 30A for now. Okay, that didn't take long. Let's check out Grayton Beach. I don't learn. Here we are in Seaside, a very nice looking town, you know, plant community. From here on, we're going to be hugging the coast until we decide we don't want to anymore. Bye, Panama City. This here to the left is called Airstream Row. There are five of these airstreams converted into food trucks, and they are here permanently, by the way. The offerings are supposed to be pretty gourmet, too. What I would give to have a camper van right now, so I could just park somewhere around here and have lunch. I'm telling you, that's going to be our next RV in a couple of years. Yes, that was very cool, the Airstream Row. And by the way, we are famished. We continue speeding east. The sight of these two Illuminati-looking pyramids means we are in Alice Beach, 
which is a planned community just like Seaside and many others in this area, but this one is brand new, still under construction actually for the most part, and it is and will be the site of many vacation homes and exclusive beach villas, with very unique architecture by the way. I'm telling you, it is one of these planned communities after the other. You know what? We're just gonna grab some lunch here at Win Dixie. We are really close to Panama City by now. Amazing, the Emerald Coast. I'm repeating myself, but it is mile after mile after mile of white sandy beaches. Amazing, incredible. It is awesome. Here we are. Here we are approaching all these high-rise hotels and condos. At Panama City. Here we come. We are actually just going to cruise along uh, the main drag here. Here they have uh, the Wonderworks and Ripley's, believe it or not. Uh, so that means we are leaving. We are leaving Panama City, back to the mainland. I'm riding, riding with my RV. You see those menacing clouds over there? Wherever I want to be, it's going to rain. Cause I'm free. In my RV, yeah, I'm riding, 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 riding with my RV, my RV, wherever I Here we go through Blountstown as we make our way along the back roads of Florida towards Tallahassee, the state's capital, where we're going to merge onto I-10. And boy, did it rain. My RV, wherever I wanna be. Cause I'm free in my RV Riding, riding, riding 
Riding with my RV, my RV Wherever I want to be Because I'm free Okay, to make a long story short, we arrived at Tallahassee under a torrential thunderstorm. One for the history books. Too bad the camera battery ran out. Oh man. After that, we took I-10 East and then I-95 South. We spent a night at the Walmart at Titusville, which technically doesn't allow overnight parking, but they look the other way if you don't cause any trouble. Then, off to Miami we went. We had lunch at the Cracker Barrel in Vero Beach. You can never go wrong with a grandpa's a country fried breakfast. Then one last dump at Phipps Park in Stewart. Whoa. Hey, cafe. And just like that, the great American road trip of 2016 came to an end. Keep left to stay on I-95 South. We are back in the 305. All good things come to an end. But before you go, if you liked it, do me a solid and give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Also, remember to subscribe if you haven't and check out my other videos. You can also visit the blog at travelingrobert.com, join the mailing list and follow me on social media at travelingrobert. As always, thank you so much for watching and see you on the road. Riding with my RV.